Uh, we have uh, Professor Mehta giving two lectures, uh, and then we'll have Professor Sagawa giving two lectures. These are the strong people. They can give two lectures back to back. There's no way I could do that, so. All right. Um, let me turn this down. Um, all right, welcome back. Um, the trick to giving two lectures is to make you do something interactive in between so that you don't have to talk the whole time. <laughs> uh, so let's continue. So, so far, um, we've gone through the first two of these topics, which is uh, that I wanted to emphasize that the difference between machine learning and, say, statistics, classical statistics, or optimization, is the difference between fitting and predicting. Again, the important point is that we're minimizing the energy for things we see, but what we care about is data we haven't seen yet, right? And this is the idea of generalization. And because of that, we saw that there was basically three tools that we needed, right? We needed an optimizer, we needed some loss functions, but we also needed some regularization. And what we saw is the kind of optimizers we ended up using, or that have become standard, actually exploited this difference, right? Because they didn't care what started off as tricks to make things faster, actually turned out to work better because they already introduced regularization into these things. And we saw that we also dealt with kind of standard loss functions. One of them was this kind of physics-inspired cross entropy for categorical data. And the other one was this, um, you know, L2 regularization, but in, as we'll see today very quickly, any loss function that you can take a derivative of is going to be okay, right? And basically the last, I would say, five, seven years has been a bunch of tricks on using the fact that if I can differentiate stuff, then I can actually combine any differentiable architecture with all this stuff. And somehow the fact that I make the whole architecture differentiable regularizes things so I can work in really, really high dimensions, right? So I can walk, map a million dimensional space to another, you know, I can map, a, you know, whatever the dimension of language is. I don't know, I forget what Shannon calculated the entropy of language. I don't know, I have some Ziff slot people here. I don't remember what the entropy was, right? Some humongous thing, but I can map Korean. My Google Translate will literally make a lookup table, right? From every Korean phrase almost to an English phrase and you would think that's way too high, high dimension normal space to make a map between them. But that's really where a differential network is. But the magic of making everything differentiable is somehow it regularizes thing enough that you can do it, right? So there's a joke among a lot of my friends and how we think about machine learning that modern deep learning is just differentiable lookup tables, right? So it's just a lookup table, but by making it differentiable, somehow you can do it magically. Right? It's in interpolation plus differentiable lookup tables. So I just wanted to emphasize this differentiability is very central to everything that's going on. All right? And that requires you to calculate gradients. Right? We, we noticed that we needed to be able to calculate gradients with respect to parameters. And so, you know, um, and again, the basic important thing you should take away from this, if you don't take away, somehow it's not emphasized enough. If you're not working in industry or you're not in the thing, it's really the fully differentiable or auto diff paradigm that is being, at least for the last 10 years, that's seven years. All the tricks are some trick to make something look like a diff completely differentiable function. And by doing that, you can basically do new things you could never imagine doing before. All right. And so this idea is that if I make very complicated models, right, with many layers, as we'll see when it happens, and what happens is that calculating derivatives gets hard because I have to use the chain rule. And you say, what's the big deal about the chain rule? It's super easy. Well, you're dealing with problems with millions and millions of parameters. And remember, you have to take a derivative every time you take a step. Right? So every step, derivative of a million parameters, derivative of a million parameters. So you have to be able to do that really quickly. Everyone see that? And so the interesting thing was that it turns out that you can calculate if you make a certain structure, and we'll talk about what it is beyond what's going on. If you make basically what, what is 
common to all neural network architectures right now, is that you have to be able to take this chain rule in a very efficient way. And that it's going to turn out that you're going to be able to do it very, very quickly through one forward pass through a network and one backward pass in an algorithm that's called backpropagation. All right, so that's the whole point. That you can calculate a million gradients or how many other parameters you have. If you design the architecture of your model right, you can take the gradient all once, all at once. All right, and we'll talk about what's going on. And, but I want to emphasize to you that this algorithm is just the chain rule, but a computationally efficient thing. So you choose the architecture so you can calculate the gradient in a very efficient way. So what's the basic, um, what's the basic thing? Well, deep learning is really just neural networks, right? So they rebranded it because neural networks were very out of vogue. I guess when you guys were all like six or something, no one thought, no, probably 10, no one thought the neural networks could work ever. And everyone just made fun of people who worked on them. It was a very, very ragtag band of like three or four people and some physicists who had moved on and everyone who was working on these. And, but, you know, they made a comeback, which just goes to show you that if you think an idea is good, you should keep on working on it, no matter what everyone else says. Because you never know if, you know, in the end, you're going to turn out to be right, and everyone else is just going to have to eat their words. Because I, 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 I urge you to go read some of the things people said about neural networks in 2011. <laughs> All right? It's kind of amazing. Um, and now, you know, they're supposed to take over the world. Now we're having new Cold Wars, right? Like, you know, now we have a Cold War because of these neural networks, again. So the basic idea of this neural network is that the basic element of this is what people call stylized a neuron, all right? A neuron is basically an element where you take, it takes inputs, right? X1, here I have three inputs, X1, X2, X3. It weighs them with some parameters, W1, W2, W3, so W dot X. It adds a constant shift, right? So this is just a linear function of the inputs. And then you just stick it through a nonlinearity. All right? So in the old days, the nonlinearity used to be this kind of Fermi function that was very famous. Uh, that was what people used to use, or this tanch. But in recent times, people have figured out that actually the most commonly used thing that's much more computationally uh, 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 normal is this kind of thing called a ReLU, which is basically a rectified linear unit where it's zero below the threshold and linear above it. All right? And the parameters you have for each neuron, each neuron comes just with a set of parameters, which are these weights, which are basically these arrows that tell you how you take the inputs from the neurons in the layer before. All right? So this is like, this neuron is getting an input from these three things. So this is like, for this neuron, this is W1, W2, W3 is associated with that arrow. Right? So I sum, this neuron sums the input from the things before it, adds a constant, puts it through a nonlinearity, these days only a ReLU, and that's the output. And you just do that over and over and over and over and over again. But that's the output huh? Yeah, because they're going to each of the three neurons. No, no, every arrow comes with its own parameter. So every neuron, every arrow comes with its own parameter. Every neuron comes with its own offset. Yeah, the arrows going out of for a node will be the same. No, 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 these are, well, you can choose however you want. Okay, this is what's the simplest version of a fully connected network. But actually, the whole game is to design these arrow, do fun, clever things with these things. Right? But this is the simplest version. This is a fully connected neuron where everything is connected to everything. But I could not connect some neurons. In fact, what I want you to take away from this lecture that's really unclear from reading the lecture, the literature, actually it's never said explicitly, is really what kind of architectures are allowed. Right? Everyone understands it who works in this field, but somehow no one says it very explicitly. So I'll try to explain to you what you can do. All right? And the answer is going to be things that it's easy to take the chain rule off. <laughs> All right? One of the things you'll notice about this architecture is what do you notice about arrows? They always go in one direction. 
right? There's no loops. That's going to be central to everything. So I'll just tell you the answer because it's always better to tell you the answer. It's going to turn out any architecture that I can write like this where there's no loops backwards is something that you're allowed to make. And people have exploited it to no ends to make that. All right, so as long as there's no loops, we'll see that's going to be good for us. So one of the things I want to point out is that we're eventually going to start taking derivatives. Right? And, then I, and one of the funny things that happened is that people used to use these kinds of nonlinearities, and they replaced it by this nonlinearity, and you got everything started working much better. All right? Yeah? Can you explain why it's better to have no loops? Yes, that's, that's going to be the whole point of the whole lecture. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's because otherwise you can't efficiently calculate. You can't efficiently do chain rule because you have to use implicit function theorem, essentially. <laughs> Right? You can't explicitly calculate gradients. So that's, yeah, that's, that, that's, that's the whole point. We're going to get there in a second. <laughs> I just want to point out some more things. So why has ReLU become much more things than sigmoid, right? Well, I need to calculate gradients, right? And the gradients are how I get the information about the cost function, right? Now, the problem is that if I take derivatives of these kind of functions out here, Look at these functions, they're almost flat, right? So I can't tell you much about what the input value was. The gradient is really hard to know about the input from the gradient, right? The information gets lost. Because basically everything over here basically has the same gradient. Everything over here has the same gradient. Whereas here, if I tell you, you know, I don't have that problem. So the gradients basically disappear here. They go to zero. Right? The gradients disappear. Zero, zero. Here, the gradient never disappears. And that turned out to be a very important thing because of chain rule. Because of chain rule, I have to multiply. Remember, if I multiply a bunch of small numbers, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, I get a tiny number. And when I do the chain rule, eventually, you have to multiply a bunch of derivatives backwards. <laughs> Here's the cost function. If I want some parameter here, I take the output of this, output of that, output of that. So chain rule says I multiply a bunch of numbers. And if I multiply a bunch of small numbers, everything disappears. <laughs> so that's why people started basically using this ReLU because that solves that problem. It made a big difference. So that's one big revolution that happened in the last 10 years. People realize dumb things like this can solve what was called the vanishing gradient and blowing up gradient problem. All right. So the central thing of all this stuff are what's called the backpropagation equations. And I'm just going to leave them up here because otherwise I'll get them wrong. All right, so but we'll, we'll go through them. It sounds very complicated, but it's just the chain rule. All right. So I wish I had put the picture up here. All right, so just so we're clear, right, this sigma is this nonlinearity, right? So this sigma is one of these functions here. Doesn't really matter what it is, but it's whatever the nonlinear function that you put in of the inputs. It could be a tangent, it could be a ReLU, whatever it is. And what we're going to do is we're just going to do the chain rule, all right? So if we go back here, let me define some things. We'll call, remember the inputs are x's, the weights are w, the shifts are b, and now I also have an output of the neuron, which I'll call the activation. That's the a, right? So I have activation, this is going to be a, and then I have these parameters, w and b. And I just want to take derivatives of those. Right? I want to take a derivative of the last out output of, out of the output layer with respect to W and B. That's all I'm trying to do. And you see, it's just a chain rule. I take how much does the out, if I want to know how you know, to take the derivative, I change this parameter a little. And I can ask, in principle, I can propagate how does that change. Right? So there's going to be a chain rule. Right? Because I can think of this, if I have two neurons, 
just want to make sure everyone understands. Imagine I just have the simple case of two neurons. I have neuron one, it goes to neuron two, and it goes to some outputs. So this is, you know, let me call this sigma two. This is sigma one, right? And I have some input, which is x. Can you even see that x? You can, right? So now this is the output, right? Output is some function of sigma two. So now let me call the output like this. So if I call the output some function of sigma two, right? Which is going to be a function of sigma one, which is going to be a function of w one x plus b. So if I if I just compose all this stuff, you see that it's just composition. I take x, I put it through this function sigma one, which goes through this function sigma two, which goes through this thing. So if I if I now uh, if I just uh, let me write this sigma one of a one, right? And then I have sigma two a two of sigma this. So let me just write it out explicitly, right? So a one here is going to be say omega one x plus b one, right? And then I get sigma of a one a two, right? So if I if I write this. Um, so these are called z's, what I've written down. Oh, I'm on the next page. All right. So you see, I've taken the linear part and called this z. So z1 is just omega 1 x plus b1. And then the output of the neuron, a1, is just sigma z1. Then I get a2, right? Now I get z2 is just going to be w2 times a1 plus b2. And then the output is going to be sigma z2. This sounds, it, it looks ridiculous for me to differentiate these things, but you'll see that this is just those equations. <laughs> now I take the derivative. Say so I want to take the derivative of, I want to know how does the function f change if I change w1? Right, everyone see? I just want to know this. So what do I do is I just say, let me move this up here. Right, so what I do is I say, look, it's f df da2 da2 dz2 dz2 da uh, da1 da1 dz1 dz1 dw1 right so i can just go through and multiply and that's the chain rule So the claim is, these equations are the same as those equations. That's all that's going on here. So let's think about how it goes through. All right. So the first thing you can do that's worth defining is that you see that it's natural to work in these equations z and a. Just introduce extra variables, z and a. a is the activation of each neuron, and z is just the linear sum of the activations on the last layer. So you just go through. And you see, I can define these quantities that are important, which are these kind of delta LJs, which is just the derivative of this output, which I called F, but I should have called E. Right, because that's the notation I've been using. I just say, OK, let me define these things, which is the derivative of E with respect to this ZJ. And so these layers L, this L, is going to be this little L just labels the layer. So this is L equals you know, 1. This is L equals 2. Whatever. This is L equals 3. So I can it's useful to just label things by neurons and layers. So I have this ZJ of L, which is just the jth neuron in the Capital L is the last layer. 
So this I can just calculate, because this is not a chain rule thing. This is the last neuron. Then what I can do is I can now look, just use the chain rule to say, OK, if I have some other layer, L, DE, DL is just the derivative of the energy with respect to the activation times sigma prime ZL, G, DJ. This is just the chain rule right? that says that the activation is this function of sigma ZLG. Okay, so this is the first equation. The second equation, ah, how did you change? Oh, Adobe always wants me to update something. I, I just like, I don't understand that company. I feel like it's like constantly updating. And it never works. That's the worst part. <laughs> All right, but now look, right? Look at these delta LJs. Well, look, because Z is a linear function of BLJ, right? Derivative with respect to Z is the same as the derivative with respect to B. Right? So this is some of the gradients we want. So if I can calculate these delta LJs, then I'm okay. I have one, of, one side of the gradients I want. Right? I, I want DE, DBJ, and I want DE, DW. All right. Now, look. What's nice now is I can do the same thing and say, look, I calculate delta LJ, and delta LJ I can express at a layer L in terms of delta L at a layer above. Right? So this is a recursive relationship that says, if I know delta L at this last layer, right? in this thing, if I know deltas at this layer, I can calculate the deltas at this layer. Right, so deltas, I can propagate backwards. Right, that's the whole point. This is why it's called backprop. If I know the deltas here, I can calculate the deltas here, I can then calculate the deltas here, then calculate the deltas here, and so on. Right, so this is just chain rules. I haven't done anything. But it gives us this really nice thing is that if I know the parameters and I know the z's, then I can calculate the deltas backwards. Everyone see that? Then the final thing is that, look, I can also take the derivative with respect to the parameters. So this is the parameters at the alpha layer, con 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 whatever, connecting the jth neuron in the alpha layer to the kth neuron in the L minus 1 layer. Right? It's the derivative with respect to the whatever. If this is the alpha layer, the kth neuron, this is the jth neuron, it's this w that weights this thing. And what you see now again is that I just do the chain rule and I get this, you know, I can get this gradient in terms of these delta Lj's times the activities. I haven't done anything fancy. But now look at the amazing thing. What do I do? Look, this, if I know the activities of everything, then I know the Z's. Right? The Z's and the activities are whatever. So now I give you, what I do is I give you an input. I give you some input. Right? It's really computationally efficient to just calculate all the Z's and A's. Because that's just composing a function over and over again. I give you an input, I calculate the z's here, then I calculate the a's here, that allows me to calculate the z's here, that allows me to calculate the a's here, that allows me to calculate the z's, the a's, the z's, the a's, all the way to the end. But then, once I know those z's and a's, I can use these equations because I know sigma prime analytically, right? I know what this is. Right, for the values, it's either 1 or 0. <laughs> right, if it's above the threshold, it's 1. Otherwise, it's 0. I can just... Now, this one I just calculate, because it's just a single gradient. But now I can just use this recursive things to calculate all the gradients all at once. 
So what's the trick? This is backdrop. So I calculated all the gradients. Uh, sorry. I calculated all the gradients by basically going once forward, where I calculated all the activations, and then calculating all the deltas backwards. So all I have to do is one forward pass and one backward pass. And I get all the gradients. Now you can ask, what did I exploit when I did this? So this was just a very particular architecture, but now let's think about what, what, what we want to do. Let's see if I get this right this time. No. Almost. All right. I have till 10.45, right? 10.45? Yeah. Okay. All right. Having said that, now someone tell me, what's the most arbitrary architecture I can draw to have a chain rule? To exploit this backdrop, what do I need? When will it go wrong? When won't this trick work? I'll just sit here. I don't care. <laughs> Why won't it work? What goes wrong? Let's do it with two neurons. Someone draw me a, take 30 seconds and draw me an architecture where with two neurons this doesn't work. You can already see what it won't work with two neurons. So I have an input, I have a neuron, I have a neuron, I have an output. Why won't this work? It's just the chain rule. You don't even have to take a derivative. Okay, how about if I do this and then I do this? What will happen? Just work it out. Take 30 seconds, think for yourself. What will go wrong? Because it's the unknown variety, right? Huh? Yeah, so now, every, this is a function of that, which is a function of this. Just work out the chain rule, we can just work it out. <laughs> All right, this is an exercise for you. Show that the backdrop algorithm doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, you can't do it. You can't do it. It's implicit function theorem. It's really important for this that anything here doesn't depend on anything, that this stuff here doesn't depend on anything in front of it. This is enough to, for to you to understand all the architectures that this will work for. If you understand this example and why it fails, then you'll be okay. That's all there is. So, yeah? Calculating Z, what would happen? I mean, we have to input X here. Yeah, so you can input X. You calculate Zs, right? But how will you calculate Z because there's a... Yeah, so that's the whole idea. So what's the whole idea? How do you even calculate it, right? You have to, you have to go back and converge and do whatever, right? That's the whole, the whole point is, in principle, I can make a function like this, right? This is x. This is a function of f of x and g, right? And this is g of f of x. So this is just a function like this of x. So there's no, there's no problem, right? So this is, this is the way it goes. In principle, I can calculate it. <laughs> it has to converge, it's annoying, I probably have to iterate it, but this is the implicit function. All right, let me use the actual, instead of f and g's, let me just use the actual thing. Here's sigma one of x, but now it takes two inputs. Right, so I just specify whatever sigma one is. It takes this input, x1, right? So this function is some function x1 and y1. So this is x1, and let me call this y1. Now y1 itself is f of, you know, and this is sigma 2 of sigma 1 of x. But now this is what y2 is, so this is sigma 1 of sigma 2 of sigma 1 of x. 
So in principle, this is fine. It is whatever it is. It defines a network of functions. But you can't calculate derivatives of this because you see it has these implicit functions. Everything becomes functions of everything else. So these chain rule arguments don't go through. So what the most general architecture you can build is you can build anything you want, however complicated you want it to be. Anything like this, it'll all work. What doesn't this have? It doesn't have any backward loops. It doesn't have feedbacks. It has to be feed forward. Right? Any feed forward network doesn't work. And that's been the trick. If I have, I have to turn everything into a feed forward network. Even if I have time series, I unroll time, that's what a recurrent neural network is. If I have generative models, I draw random, I, I can throw in stuff like drawing a random number and throwing it in here and putting it through a neural network. That's how you make generative models generally. But everything is feed forward. And you can put in any module you want. As long as it's differentiable, right? All that I need is this is some function. So any arbitrary function can be put in here. And then I just run through this. I can put a Monte Carlo sampler in here. That's often done. This is the modern deep learning revolution. And basically now, since 2017, 18, they've made tons of packages. This goes under the name of Autodiff. And the whole point of these libraries is that they'll take derivatives of everything for you. It's fully differentiable. And the reason they're fully differentiable means that they do, they, you can put them into a backprop algorithm. You don't have to write it yourself, though you should all write backprop one time yourself to understand it. <laughs> So most of the cleverness has been, how do I exploit this basic architecture? Because then I can do chain rule in one pass forward and one pass, right? In any graph like this, I can do things in one pass forward and one pass backwards. So for example, another big imaging thing was that people realized this, and they made something called ResNet, where in the old days, people used to just make things like this. And then in about 2017 or 18, they figured out, maybe it was 2016, they figured out that, oh, we should just make direct, what happens is that if I made very deep networks, the information about the input was getting lost. So they just decided, oh, let's just put big connections from the input to arbitrary places in deep networks. And those were called residual connections. So that information didn't get lost. So every time people do something clever, it's some clever thing of turning a problem the goal of deep learning is to turn a problem into a problem that looks like this. Whether it's a time series, whether it's a generative model, whatever it is, that's, that's what modern deep learning is. <laughs> All right, that's what I want you to take away that's not written down anywhere. <laughs> At least in very few places. That is the modern deep learning revolution. How do I write this as a differentiable thing? And the second thing is that it turns out that every function you want to care about, you can approximate pretty well with a pretty complicated neural network. Right? And so what I do is I just say, oh, I don't know what this function is. It has a bunch of, I'm going to replace it by a neural network. And then I learn the function directly from the data. And I fully differentiate it. That's basically the idea of deep learning. You have to unroll it. That's called a recurrent neural network. And basically what you do is you basically, so imagine I have a feedback like this. What do I do is I unroll this thing. So you can imagine this is at time t, t plus one or something. Time is the classic thing. They unroll this thing to make it look like this. So you just imagine this is the first time I went through the loop, the second time I went through the loop, the third time I went through the loop. And you can't keep infinite feedback, but you can go, you can keep how many every times so you want to go through the loop. So you have to deal with it. A lot of cleverness is dealing with this. 
But I want to represent more complicated things, but I want to replace it with something that I can fully differentiate. All right. So this is basically what modern deep learning is about. And the, it's getting cleverer and cleverer in how people design these things, right? So these are the models. Like, you know, at some point people figured out you could throw a Monte Carlo, throw it in there. You could put in an optimizer that's fully differentiable, throw it in there. That's been basically the cleverness of the whole thing, right? Very clever people, a lot of hyperparameter tuning, right? A lot of architecture tuning, all these things like that. So let's write, a, let's write the simplest version of a neural network. All right, so uh, let me put this down. Oh yeah, I should add that everything I'm doing here, every figure I've shown you, is actually, you know, where you and all these notebooks are actually from this review, right? So they're from my review. I spent last sabbatical writing this to make it easy for people to learn machine learning, and also because I didn't like all the hype, so I wanted people to get it in a hype-free format. <laughs> um, that's what it is. This is maybe one fifteenth. 120th of what's in that review. Um, uh, I actually like the chapters that are not on fully differentiable models and energy-based models much, much better. <laughs> but, you know, yeah, you know, it's just like, a, I guess, I, I feel bad for all these musicians who probably have all these songs they love, and then every time you go to a concert, you have to play like the same three hits songs over and over again. So deep learning is like the hits, right? You have to explain it whether you like it or not. <laughs> Anyway, it doesn't matter. In Korea, maybe with K-pop, there's no real deep music anyway. So I shouldn't say that. See, that's the kind of thing I shouldn't say. <laughs> um, all right. So what we're going to do is open up, go back to the same place on Google Colab, right? Um, and uh, let's open up Notebook 10. All right, so here is Google Colab Notebook 11. All right, and, and again, the basic idea is that we're gonna go through these MNIST, you know, MNIST digits. This is not even considered, you know, a data set anymore. About 10 years ago, it was considered a serious data, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, it was considered a serious data set. Now it's not even considered a serious exercise in anything. Um, that that day is long gone, but it's good to learn how to write these things. stuff works yourself. All right. I'll use this thing for now. Um, all right, so this is Keras. And 
what's nice about Keras is that once you get more interested, there's these code examples and you can just like walk through very, very complicated stuff, transformers for, you know, distilling vision and it's all 300 lines of code or less, right? So they have like, you know, BERT, BERT is like the most famous uh, simple text extraction, but you'll be surprised how quickly you can get to state of the art stuff if you spend a few hours a week or a few hours a day at doing this stuff. So the code we're gonna go to is this notebook that I said before, notebook 11. And the goal is to basically do these MNIST. So again, MNIST is these 70,000 handwritten digits, 28 by 28 pixels that were made in the 90s data, data set. It's irrelevant now, but it's nice to learn for like, it's like the hello world of, uh, of machine learning. I think that's the best way to describe it. Like maybe once upon a time, it was hard to make the screen say hello world, but now, you know, it is whatever it is. Um, and so what we're gonna do is we're going to take, it's 28 by 28, 256 nuances. So what we're gonna do is the first thing you have to do is take this thing, cause I wrote these notebooks a long time ago, like six years ago, which is infinity machine learning. Co comment out this random seed thing right here. Otherwise you're gonna get error, errors because the, the command has changed. <laughs> All right, so everyone commented out that trans, that thing. Now run, now run this thing. So what it's gonna do is it's gonna import this Keras, sklearn, it's gonna import TensorFlow, which is the back end. That's also been kind of discontinued. Google is trying to push jacks on everyone. Um, and NumPy, so I just run this thing and run anyway. And it should work, okay. Apparently there's too many people calling things from here maybe. I don't know. Oh, it's running. And you shouldn't get an error. Everyone run it and make sure they don't get an error. See, I have this little check mark with five seconds. Did everyone get it to run? And then we're gonna work in groups and think about what's going on. Work for everyone, raise your hand if it didn't work. Or raise your hand if it did work. Did everyone get it to work? Well, everyone didn't raise their hands. I don't understand how people can be shy about raising their hand. It's mysterious to me. Raise your hand if it worked. Keep your hand in the air. Wave it if you just don't care. Okay, no, no. I'm gonna start kind of wrapping up here for you. You have error? Did you turn off this trans, did you turn off this TF random set seed? Did you comment it out? Then you shouldn't get an error. I'm surprised because it's working for everyone else. Did you comment this out? That's just, that, that, someone help them. Okay, good, all right. So here's the basic idea of how you write a neural network. You load and process the data, define the model and its architecture, choose the optimizer and cost function. See, you guys all know what this stuff means now. Then we train the model, evaluate the model on unseen test data. Yes, we know that, right? And then we, the last thing which we haven't talked much about is we have to modify the hyperparameters and optimize stuff, right? So this notebook is just gonna walk you through that. So the first cell just loads and processes the data. And so what we've done is we have training data, the MNIST is naturally divided into training and test data. So it's 28 by 28 pixels. Uh, we're gonna reshape it into just flat vectors. So we're gonna ignore the matrix, the two by two structure and just make it into one big 784 pixel input. So the input's just 700, a vector of size 784. And then what we're gonna do is we're going to rescale the data on the interval zero to one. It's always good to rescale all your data, all right? Because remember what we were talking about, we wanna treat all directions equally. That's what all these optimizers do. So you don't wanna have data, some of it is, imagine the natural scale of something is 100,000 and another thing is 0 0.01, the model gets confused rescale all your data so it lives in the same interval. So generally between zero and one, if you can. I mean, not zero and one, but like of order one. And then we're gonna convert, this is just um, making one hot vectors, it's not really important. So now just run the cell and make sure it works. And this is a typical example of a data point with label four. Right, you can change it to something else. Everyone tell me if it works. Raise your hand once it starts working. All 
All right. So now here's where fun stuff happens. All right. So this is the simplest thing. So now we have to define a neural network. Right? So now we have to choose our model. And look at this very simple thing that we're going to put in. Right? I didn't tell you what dropout is, but we can just comment that out. It's not important for what you do. So just comment out that dropout. Dropout is a kind of regularization. Um, and I don't have, in like three lectures, I can't tell you anything about it. <laughs> right? But just comment that out. It's not important. So here is my deep neural network. This is all I need. What is it? Well, sequential just means that I'm doing a really simple neural network where every layer connects to every other layer. Right? It's not this complicated. Remember, I drew this stuff on the board with complicated stuff that skipped layers and did all this stuff. All this. Here, I skipped that layer. Sequential is just for models where every layer is connected to the layer before. All right? So it's the simplest kind of deep neural network. So now what I do is I just add stuff. So you see, now I added a layer where I added 400 neurons, right? So this thing here, I start and it adds a layer of 400 neurons whose input is just whatever the shape is. I mean, 784 here. And its activation function, what's the activation function? What do people think it is? It's the nonlinearity. It's just a ReLU. And then, I add another layer with how many neurons? 100. Why do I have to give the input? Why do you think I don't have to give the input dimension? Because I've already told it it's a sequential model, so it knows how many outputs are in the last one. And then forget this dropout, right? And then I add the soft max layer, which is the classification layer. The last layer, remember, I want to make categories. And the, the, and the way we make categories is we need that probability. We need 10 neurons, each that tell you the probability of being in each category. And then remember, that was done with SoftMac, that Boltzmann-like thing that we talked about yesterday. If it doesn't all make sense to you, it doesn't matter. I just want you to understand the basic logic, and you're going to have to play with it. If this is all you ever do with this, it'll never make any sense to you anyway. <laughs> But remember what softmax was? That was um, essentially this, this thing here. Remember we did these kind of softmax things here? Remember the probability? If we had 10 things, we made these kind of layers with 10 output neurons. Right? So I need the probability. Uh, M goes up from 1 to 10, because there's 10, 0 to 9 is the numbers. So I need a soft max with 10. All right. So I make a soft max, right? And, and has 10, the number of classes, that has 10 neurons as the output, because that's how many I need. Right? And that's the probability of being in the given class. And then I just run this. So everyone run this. And if it runs successfully, we'll keep on going. I think mine ran, has a little check mark. All right, now we just choose an optimizer and a cost function. All right, that's the next thing. And look, I compile my model, so I create it. Then here, I have to use my loss, and I have to use my optimizer, and the metrics are just what I plot. So the optimizer I'm using, you see up here, is Adam. Adam, do this. Let me run this thing. Everyone run it. All right. And then we train the model. So here we go. Now I have to tell you what my bat size is, how many epics I have, what model I used, and then the history is just a way of keeping track of what's going on. So I run this thing, and you'll see this thing. And what I do is 
in my training error, right, uh, I'll explain what's going on here once we run it, but everyone start running this thing. And change your epics, 10 is going to take too long, so change your epics to like 4. So just start running it. So I start running it, and it goes, right, here's the first epic. This is the number of mini batches there are, 938 is going through them. This is my lost function. This is my accuracy. This is how well I'm doing on the training debt. So I, right now I'm classifying 94% of these. And then validation loss is like you take some of your training data set and you try to predict on it. You don't train on it. It's for helping you tune hyperparameters. And you ask how well you're doing. And you keep on going and I'm done, right? So I got an accuracy of 98.67% on my training data. On validation, which is like a small little test set, I got 98% accuracy. All right? So, and then here I'm going to evaluate it on test data. So now I evaluate it on test data. Here we go. Oh, I did something wrong. Oh, shoot, I have to change this. I think that, oh, yeah, I remember now. Change this ACC to accuracy. Here. Change that to accuracy. Again, this is because I wrote these five years ago. Code wasn't stable back then. <laughs> accuracy. Okay, and now it should work. Ah. Oh, val ac. Everything that says ac, change it to accuracy. All right, so here you go. So this is what it looked like, right? So in the training error, the accuracy you see in the, as I went through the epics, it got kept getting better and better and better. And the test accuracy basically leveled off, even though the training accuracy keeps increasing. Because you start overfitting if you go too long. So early stopping, which is meaning you stop it early so you don't overfit is another form of regularization. And then what you can do is you can basically modify the hyperparameters. And this we're not going to go through, but basically what you can do is you can change the optimizer here. You can change, you know, um, so here we're just like going over optimizers, I guess. I didn't put anything else, <laughs> right? So you can ask how you do on different optimizers, and you see you should recognize some of these. These are all just different, doesn't matter. Stochastic gradient descent was whatever we did. RMS prop is kind of like Adam, whatever. These are all just variations of second moment problems. It doesn't matter. And you can go through, and generally you still have to search through all the choices I made and see which one works best. But we're not going to do that here. All right, so, that, so what I want you to do for the last, how much time do we have, 20 minutes? Right, is just do some exercises. Yeah, so what I want you to do is work with a friend, right? Take 15 minutes. All right, just go through these. See if you can do it. See if you can play with the code. All right? And Google is your friend. <laughs> Documentation is your friend. All right? Again, the, my purpose is to show you that you can just actually go up, pick some code up, and do it. And it's not that hard. <laughs> I think there's like this big activation barrier to initially, the first time you write it, because it seems so overwhelming. And then once you're done with that, you're like, oh, it's not that bad. So that's what I hope you get out of this. <laughs> All right, 15 minutes, and then we'll come back and discuss. All right, this is just to play around. Play with a friend. So what's our current architecture? Our current architecture, so let's draw our current architecture, right? Let's go here. Uh, oh, I don't mean that. I mean after the 100. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was debating playing with a different, uh, different notebook. <laughs> uh, 
just change the architecture. Make it really wide. Make it really narrow. Just add one layer of two. How well do you do? Think about, you know, play, play. Just think about what you're doing. I just want you to play a little bit for 15 minutes. That's the goal. <laughs> Performance. That's basically the goal, right? Play around.
Okay, hopefully you guys played around a little bit, right? Um, I should add, I, I don't know. At the bottom, there's a cell on a different kind of architecture, which is called a convolutional neural network. All right, you can go look up what it is. All right, and the basic idea is now I do image filtering. These tend to work better. But the point is like, look, I, you have to go Google. <laughs> you have to read. Um, even, even if you don't want to do that, you'll see that in this thing you opened up, if you go back here, you'll see there's all these notebooks I wrote, um, right? And they have different kinds of things, right? So here's a, you know, here is a different thing with a SUSE data set, right? And you can, you can just go through and play, right? But what I just want to show you is that it's not that hard to write this code, right? At least initially to start playing. And it's really, you have to play. It's a numerical experimental field. It's an empirical field, right? The best thing you can do is re-implement papers you read. So it's not that hard. <laughs> Open it up. The documentation's amazing. You can usually find the answer to Google on Google of lots of stuff. But then you will also get confused. It's like all coding. There's some shape that doesn't agree. There's some funny little code thing you got wrong. You try so always whenever you take some code, try to change it. And you'll find that you break it quickly and then you don't understand and you go back. You know, it's the usual thing. It's re you know, it's empirical numerical conversations, uh, things. So in the last, you know, five minutes I have in this lecture, I just wanted to tell you what, how you should really understand how you build something, right? And this is really, um, this is really the deep learning workflow, I would say, for most problems. So what you do is the first thing you want to know is how good can you do anyone do on that task, right? So you have some task which is classifying something. And you want to establish, is my neural network close to being that good or bad at something, right? So for example, and this is called finding an optimal error rate or establishing a Bayes, Bayes error rate, right? So you want to know what's the best you could do on a task because you want to have some metric for establishing how close your model is to the best you could do. And the best thing you should do is usually ask a bunch of experts or something like an expert that says, what's going on, right? So a lot of deep neural networks is about automating things that humans can do very easily, right? So you ask, how good is this? What's the best I could do, right? And then what you do is there's two things that can happen. You're either overfitting or you're underfitting, right? And this is going to be the theme of the next thing too. You don't have to take pictures. It's in the review. Go read the review. All these figures are straight from my review. <laughs> Our review. It's not just my review. A lot of people worked very hard on that review. I should stop saying my review. I don't mean to usurp credit in any way. <laughs> um, though I did, wa I mean, I used to say I wasted my whole sabbatical because I thought it would take me a month and it took me 11 months to write. And even then I couldn't finish it and everyone helped me on that review so much. But enough people have told me they found it useful that I feel less bad about doing that with my whole sabbatical. So, um, so if the training error is too high, that means your model's not complicated enough. That's called underfitting, right? Your bias is too big. So what you should do is you should either need to train longer, you need a new model architecture, or often what's missing from all this is data. You might not just ha might not have enough data, right? You might need to get more data. If the training error is not high, then the question is, is the validation, and validation is like a test set, but it's not a test set because you're never allowed to tune anything on the test set. So what you do is you take your training data set, you divide that into a training data set and a validation data set, and the validation data set is like a test set, uh, which I use to tune hyperparameters, architectures, things like that, right? If I'm gonna change anything, I can't use the test set. The test set is after I'm all done. I declare victory, then I can check what I did on the test set. I can't check what I did on the test set before that. So if I have to change hyperparameters, change stuff, I have to make like a separate, what I call a validation test set, which is like a test set that I change, use to change things. 
So now if the validation error is high, but the training error is low, that means you're overfitting, right? You're fitting weird things in the training data set that are not generalizable. So that means you have to regularize more, or you need more data, or you need new model architecture or something until, and you need to keep on going here, right? So this is basically your model's not expressive enough. This is your model, you're overfitting, so you have to regularize. This is basically a mismatch between the training and test error. And then if that's done, then you're done, right? That's basically the workflow. So this is all hyper, and then often you have to tune so many hyperparameters, right? Each of these errors is actually training lots and lots of models with different hyperparameters, changing stuff around. And that's why it gets so computationally expensive. That's why you hear numbers like it took $30 million worth of extra, you know, uh, you know, electricity to train, you know, whatever, the open AI, whatever the new thing is, I don't know, whatever they are, like, you know, all these things, right? 40 million. It's because you can't, you're not just training it once. If you were just training it once, you'd be okay. It's because you have to try a million different architectures, a million different hyperparameters. You have to do all this stuff, right? And often you can have the right idea, but you have the wrong hyperparameter, and then you think it doesn't work, but it is actually the right idea. So it's really just, you have to, you have to play, right? And the last thing I want to emphasize is that there's lots and lots of examples, right? Even if I just go to Keras, so these are examples of things you might want to do, right? So here is image segment, you know, so, and what's nice about all these is they have less than 300 lines of code, and you can see how much you can do with 300 lines of code. So for example, here is a neural network that learns how to segment images, right? All it takes as its input is a picture, and an output is the outline of the object you want to do, right? And then you have to come up with a loss function, right? So now I say, oh, I'm gonna, so now the neural network is designed to take an image, put an output, and now you have to come up with a loss function. So you have to decide how am I going to measure the loss between what the neural network outputs and what this outputs, right? So often use, I don't know what they use in this particular thing. There's a very prominent architecture that's become very popular for doing this kind of thing, which is called UNET. You can just go read about it. You don't have to build, if you're just applying pre-existing methods, you don't have to build them off the shelf, right? So in biology in the last three, four years, like it's, it's hilarious, it's like the rest of biology. Three years ago, you could get a nature paper or nature communications paper with a UNET thing, and now everyone has a UNET, right? You know, whatever. <laughs> but my whole point is you shouldn't be scared. So it's 300 lines of code, right? This is all it is. Right, and and um, and again, I can tell you what the output is because I can read this thing. It looks like the way they're putting an output is softmax. So they're saying this is the probability of being the output, and they're using cross entropy to do this thing. Right, so I can just look through, do this. There's much more complicated stuff. Right, so uh, let me see. Well, you can just go through and look at all these things, you know, and. And, and these are like, you know, pretty com these are pretty complicated stuff, right? And you can do it all with 300 lines of code. The other thing I should point out that I didn't have a chance to talk about is computation matters. Everything is faster on GPUs, but actually coding for GPUs in these libraries is trivial. It's usually just a flag. You just say GPU true. <laughs> all right. So back in the day, it was really hard to do this, and now it's trivial, essentially. Um, so using, so I think this is going to be an important tool in everyone's toolbox. Going forward, I don't think, you know, I'm not one of these people who thinks like deep learning is going to put science out of business. I mean, I don't think it has that capability any more than like linear algebra has the capability of putting science out of business. But we know linear algebra is useful, and we know this is going to be really useful going forward. So you should just... The sooner you familiarize yourself with these things, the better it'll be for you. All right, so I think that's all I want to say about this. And in the next lecture, I'm gonna do some more theory. I'm gonna do, there's only so much basic stuff I can do. So I'm gonna give you a research talk, mostly because I'm not gonna be here next uh, 
next week because I have to go back and teach back in Boston. So um, I'll tell you something about bias invariance and double descent in neural networks. That's kind of interesting. At least we're really proud of it. We're really proud of these papers we're going to talk about. Okay. So see you in 15 minutes, I guess. Uh, any questions? No? The notebook answered everything? <laughs> All right. So we'll see you back here at uh, 